set on the precise tricentenary of the 2030 UN deadline for a new world order, <coughs> the Great Reset. Pronouns Eating bugs Actual bugs Gig jobs Diversity hires Loading screens Cutscenes Girl bosses. Nor am I in any way attempting to make a statement about the competence of the current security forces and or apparatus in Aquila City. Shut up, love. Brokeback space cowboys. Segregated classes. Environmental catastrophes. To be fair, some parts of the UK already look this bad. Universal bisexuality. Christ, even the clones are transsexual in this future reality. Clone, honestly, isn't even really the right term for our relationship. Lubricant. Lots and lots of lubricant. More loading screens. Wonk eye. Living in pods. Some bloke with shit on his face. And whatever that is. Walking. Lots and lots of walking. You would think that they would have invented e-bikes or mobility scooters in the future. But no. I have to walk everywhere. This had better not be running on bloody windows. Finally, we get to experience a game that was 25 years in the failing. Welcome to Starfield. It's a great reset simulator. Massive spoiler warning. This bloated and absolutely massive video is so extremely full of massive spoilers that it will make people cry. At least you get a warning, which is more than Todd, Truth is Subjective Howard gave us about there not being real space exploration in this game. This video is an extremely spoiler rich environment, so bail out now if you don't want me to tell you about lots of secret stuff. Plot twists, the big plot reveal, and how Sarah Morgan turns out to be an android. <sighs> but I'm not. Just kidding about the android stuff. Or am I? Before the zealots of the Church of Bethesda show up at my door and try and nail me to a Bethesda logo and suffocate me with their cum socks, I would just like to qualify this. Believe it or not, some of the best and worst games I have ever played have had a Bethesda logo on the box. And I mean that very literally. Not the box part, mind. What I mean is that some of my all-time favourite, most played, completely grinded out games I have ever loved have been created by Bethesda and lied about by Todd, I gaslight for a living Howard. Similarly, some of the worst games I've ever played have been Bethesda 2, like Fallout 70 Fuck and Redfall. Yes, yes, Bethesda only technically published Redfall, but come on, it was an interdepartmental project and Bethesda own Arcane Studios. FY, le fucking I. Qualification. I'm 300 plus hours in, playing on hard. I did not get a free early access copy of the game, nor any of the many highly lucrative sponsorship deals to plug this game like it was the best thing since strings on tampons. In fact, I could typify my relationship with Bethesda thusly. More than half of all my Bethesda game reviews have been demonetized at best, and one was flagged for incitement to violence 
and other criminal infractions, until it was all overturned on appeal, because it was a complete fabrication. It's safe to say, we are not on good terms. I have given Starfield a good run for its money, I completed some faction quest lines, I've done most of the achievements, nearly finished the main plot, which I know all about, wink wink. I own lots of spaceships, some of which I pirated, and I have sold many more. I have built several bases, I own several nice houses. I'm over level 100. I have spammed more adaptive frames than most. But I will still not claim to fully know this game inside out, because as a die-hard Fallout fan, and a die-hard Skyrim fan, I know that people will still be discovering new stuff in this game after 1000 hours of play. Hello. That's a nice way of saying that I gave it my absolute best shot, and I have no skin in this game one way or the other, be that financial or personal. Enon Zor Disclaimer Because the tight-fisted bean counters of Bethesda have not paid off the full copyright for the music of this game, as per fucking usual, anyone playing the soundtrack in their videos will get slapped with a big fat copyright claim by Enon Zor, the snaffler of YouTubers' ad revenue. After all, those hundred grand pianos and million dollar mansions ain't gonna buy themselves, right? So I will be using replacement music, which hopefully will be true to the spirit of the game. <coughs> in fact, it will most likely be better. Seriously, Enon Zur peaked with Fallout 3, plateaued with Skyrim, and it's been so generic since then, I swear he got early access to ChatGPT. Oh, and before we crack the sternum open and start fishing around in the chest cavity of Starfield with our bare hands, I would strongly recommend you check out Synthetic Man's video, aptly entitled Starfield is Creatively Bankrupt, where he describes this game with the level of piss and of vitriol that is rare to see these days. Similarly, you might want to swing by Razor Fist and Worth a Buy while you're at it, because these are the only authoritative sources that I can vouch were not paid off. And much kudos to Uncle Mumble's video, where he deep dives into the weapon and perk mechanics, which I found to be an incredibly useful resource, and saved me all the effort of discovering how broken everything is myself. This whole captain thing really well, you know. So what is Starfield? Starfield is essentially a dog's dinner of many science fiction games, tropes, and mechanics, all stuffed into a sack that says decades old game engine, shaken about until it feels sick, which yet somehow manages to omit some of the most critical and expected aspects of a space exploration game for reasons that still have many of us scratching our fucking heads. Music, Isaac. Music, Isaac. If you are familiar with the genre, you will notice elements of Elite, No Man's Sky, X-Series, Wing Commander, Everspace, Cyberpunk 2077, figuratively and literally, Freelancer, and Outer Worlds, the pioneer of the subgenre of space games where you're never really in space games. This is combined with all the walking simulator action of Death Stranding, only here everything is procedurally generated and mostly not beautiful to look at. Basically, Starfield is absolutely every old, tired, and dated Bethesda video game trope combined with nearly every space exploration, trading and base building video game trope, all bundled up haphazardly into the trappings of Todd Howard's shame-faced overselling and procedurally generated bullshit. Starfield is also essentially proof of two truisms. Quantity has a quality all of its own, in a not-so-good way, 
and a jack of all trades is a master of none, in a possibly slightly more positive way. Ironic that I may have just accidentally quoted Joseph Stalin, because judging by some of the characters, script and concepts in Starfield, clearly they were not afraid to hire a lot of commies as creatives. The very essence of Starfield can be described as not what we were led to believe it would be. Disabuse yourself of any notion of flying around exploring space for a moment. Sit down, take a deep breath, take your hand out of your pants and clear your mind. Starfield is a space-themed game crowbarred into a reskinned version of Fallout 4 with some space battle minigames and base building activities thrown in and it's all gaffer taped together with a shit ton of loading screens to hide the cracks. The omnipresent cracks. In fact, if you've played Fallout 4, you know roughly how Starfield plays. It's like sticking a toy space helmet on and pretending your desk is a cockpit of a spaceship. That's it right there. Just check the helmet for mould first. Just saying. It's an RPG with no level cap and a rather sophisticated perk system. You do main quests, side quests, side missions and gig jobs. You explore, kill, loot and scavenge. There are factions which you can join because of Bethesda tropes. You do a lot of jogging because private vehicle ownership is banned after the Great Reset. You land on mostly procedurally generated worlds with cookie cutter locations and repeat this process with the addition of some surveying. Some are such a rampant cookie cutter design that you will start to memorise where that anti-personnel mine will be on the approach path. You know what I'm talking about. You build little and not so little bases with the world's most dysfunctional and badly implemented base building editor ever fucking created. Think programming in C++. Blindfold. And without any training. You craft, harvest, scavenge some more, upgrade your guns and collect metric tons of crap space food that mostly gets vended because unless they have some critical XP buff, they are more of a hindrance than a boon. All these activities, radial quest hubs and subplots are all strung onto the big story arc of the game, which goes something like this. You are a pointless dickhead. You finger a magical rock which gives you an acid trip and makes you dizzy. Then some smarmy bastard arrives and gives you a space Winnebago and free membership to a shitty private space explorers club because video games. They don't actually do much exploring, which doesn't make sense. So they recruit you to travel around the galaxy collecting space clutter. Then you have to hang it on this techno space mobile so they can all grumble about it. You get your own bedroom, quest to do and free companions that are almost universally annoying and universally bisexual. But it's a free shag, so that saved me a few quid. Then you set off on your thousand hour odyssey to follow these little blue dots around through an eternal procession of loading screens, cutscenes and animations. Occasionally looking down at the little arrows on the ground if the route to the blue dot is particularly complicated. I guess it's a bit like Stargate, only replace Stargates with loading screens and plot structure with fetch quests. Did I mention it was frequently very, very boring? You can customise your character to look like a fat, sweaty, transgender amateur wrestler and more informed gamers are painfully aware of how much of a bad look that is. I guess I should swiftly move on before I get myself into more trouble. You continue your epic odyssey of bimbling around space in a ship that perpetually runs out of cargo capacity like some kind of kleptomaniac hoarding van lifer. You get increasingly pissed off with the amount of time you spend in offices full of girlies barking orders at you, so you eventually start grumbling too. But at least Starfield perfectly captures the very essence of space exploration. Because space is very big. It's 99.9% .9 empty, 
so travelling around in it is by very definition very, very boring. And Starfield absolutely nailed that metric. Not a lot of this world makes any scientific or narrative sense, so don't think too hard about it. Why did humanity stop exploring? They have spaceships that can jump vast distances. You would assume it would routinely happen by accident. And surely capitalism would drive people onto unexploited new territory, right? Why do I have to scan wells that have already been discovered? Some of these planets are populated and have giant cities. So did someone lose all the maps? In fact, for an explorers club, they don't seem to get out much. So no. None of it really makes any sense. Just roll with it. It's a Bethesda game. What the actual fuck were you expecting? Todd, I pretend to be honest Howard, led us all to believe that we were getting Skyrim in space. But he was lying. And if you didn't see that one coming, then you are probably the sort of person that sends all their money to a different Nigerian prince every week. Is it any good? Well, that is not an easy question to answer, especially since your enjoyment will, in large part, be a complex calculation involving factors like Are you serving life in prison with nothing else to do? Are you OCD? Are you medicated? How many Todd Howard tattoos you have on your body? Do you have incredibly low standards when it comes to quest design and entertainment? How long can you stare at a blank wall without getting bored? Starfield will certainly be game of the decade for some people. It will be a crushing bore for some other people. It might be a bit of both to many. It's highly defective. Nevertheless, it has some serious merits. It is ideologically dysfunctional to the point of being propaganda, and it runs like a fucked cat on PC. That's a fact. But it is very, very big. And if you are an obsessive, compulsive, kleptomaniac hoarder, there is plenty of stuff for you to tinker with here. Between visits from your probation officer. In fact, in its simplest form, this game is generally defined by three key factors. Bethesda set out to make a space game by cramming it into a very old game engine that is practically the antithesis of what is required to support this kind of game. In fact, depending on whether you think the creation engine is new or just an upgraded version of the Game Bryo engine, you could make a case that it's technically a 20 year old game engine with lots and lots of upgrades. Like this car. They also set out to make this game as woke as all fuck, and so utterly ESG compliant that it would bring a tear to Klaus Schwab's eye. Even though he's a lizard alien overlord, and I'm not sure they do cry. Lastly, they set out with the deliberate intention of creating a video game that was so expansive and huge that the people who liked it would play it for many thousands of hours. Depending on who you speak to, Elder Scrolls V Skyrim has been released 15 plus different times. It's on all platforms, it's VR, it's on mobile, it's even on your spying Amazon Alexa. So when Todd, honestly I can lick my elbow Howard, says it's Skyrim in space, well that is what they were really talking about. It's not Skyrim in space per se. It's a game they want to be as enduring and profitable as Skyrim, and played for years and years. See the distinction? So there it is really, Starfield is defined by its principal key parameters. They wanted to use their existing workflows, assets and game engine. They wanted it to be woke as all fucking weff. They wanted it to be so big that they will be selling the gold edition on PlayStation 8 and talking about it in interviews, when the real Great Reset kicks off. Just these three factors alone tell you more about Starfield than anything else. For better or for worse.
One of the biggest overhauls was done through our character generation system. We scanned a wide range of faces from different age groups and ethnicities. And by mixing and matching all that data, we were able to create highly detailed and diverse characters. We use that exact system to create all the characters and NPCs you're going to see in the game. So any character you see almost always is a character you could make yourself. Functionality and fuckery. Dear God, where do I start? You could do a video series about this one topic alone. Well, first off, I should qualify that some of the problems, issues and omissions will no doubt be getting patched, fixed or included over the first year, or more frequently fixed by modders. And that is not me making excuses for Bethesda. Fuck no. I say that just to qualify that what I say is what I found whilst playing after launch. Personally, I won't be using mods because Nexus Mods is currently behaving like a festering pit of servile corporate woke scum, but more of this later. However, much kudos and respect to the modding community itself. Naturally, the Bethesda's enhanced end-user license agreement is so malicious that it probably includes clauses which copyrights your DNA, signs over all your future creative rights to anything you write anywhere in the future ever, and makes you promise not to mention that Todd Howard is a recidivist sociopathic liar. The pre-order early access on Steam turned into a weapons grade shit show of the highest order. Basically at 0100 hours BST the clock ticked over and the game didn't unlock. I could hear the screams of re and fury echoing across the rooftops of the city. Turns out you needed to shut down Steam in order for the game to flag as available and Bethesda forgot to mention that. So we will just neatly put this one on top of the now very tall pile of nonsense that Bethesda forgot to mention about this game. Or maybe I should wait and possibly file it under bugs. Or possibly fuck ups. Talking about weapon grade shit shows, once again the utter failure of the Creation Engine 2 slash perpetually upgraded GameBro engine to handle key rebinding was in full effect. They tried a tiny bit harder to differentiate between activities, but as per any Bethesda game, once you started rebinding, you set yourself meandering down a merry little path of keybind misery. I won't list all the issues, but here are some personal examples of what happened to me after rebinding my keys for combat. When I'm building an outpost, my left strafe key is now also my build module key. So I randomly slap down modules by accident when I'm shuffling around. The scan planet hotkey tooltip on my spaceship didn't update when I rebound, because it's only a graphics file, so I have to use the mouse now. Occasionally in battle when I'm targeting enemy ships, I randomly stand up and get out of my pilot's chair, like the captain has got a fear induced winking starfish and decided to fuck off to the habitation pod to have a quick anxiety shit mid battle. And even if there is a theoretical way to fix this by doing more rebinding, I don't dare even try, because it's like a fucking clown's car. Every time I rebind one thing, something else always breaks. Everyone who rebinds keys and plays Bethesda games expected this, and we are not disappoint. It's miserable. I suppose I could theoretically find this funny, but I'm now entering my second decade of not being able to strafe left whilst doing certain activities in Bethesda games, and frankly at this point, it's getting tiresome. Naturally the game launched with no field of view slider. Of course it did. Apparently they have a poster in the Bethesda office which says, leave it to the modders lols. It does come with day one free micro stutter functionality as expected, and despite launching without weapon swap issues, for me personally, Bethesda quickly rolled out a patch which made my game lag out and hang for up to half a second every time I swapped between certain weapons. It was literally so bad for a while that I changed my playstyle because it was so infuriating. Now I'm not part of the IT crowd, but I would hazard a guess that there is some kind of bottleneck created when you swap between weapons, and especially swap out of scanner view. And this compounds with the graphics load, which amplifies this bottleneck when you move or turn around. 
I say this because the majority of all my crashes to desktop have occurred when I quickly shut down my scanner, pull out a gun and turn around all at the same time, which has sadly far too often resulted in me ending up staring at my obscene desktop wallpaper covered with pictures of boobs. I doubt any of the graphical issues are helped by the fact that prior to launch, Todd, I didn't eat the last cookie Howard, did some kind of exclusivity deal with AMD, the guys who make the graphics cards in Xboxes apparently. So the game launched with AMD support but no DLSS support. Apparently it's coming, but Bethesda has refused to respond to inquiries about why PC users with Nvidia graphics card took a bottle rocket in the arse over this. Nvidia themselves are simply pointing at Bethesda and saying, don't ask us what's going on, speak to the liar and his simpleton cousin. On a positive note, Bethesda has tried to mitigate the weapon swapping, hitching and hanging problems with a further patch. A patch that now causes me to crash the desktop more often. But I do get to look at more boobs. If Bethesda was put in charge of a fire station, I swear they would find a way to burn that fucker down. Naturally Bethesda hid a few things before launch, as they do, some of which leaked or was found out. It's locked at 30 FPS on console. The worlds are not worlds. They are a set of procedurally generated tiles assembled into a grid of compartmentalised tiles and wrapped around a virtual sphere. And when you reach the edge of any tile, you have to fast travel out and re-land in the next procedurally generated tile. There is no way to traverse across a world. You are like an ant that's been dropped into an empty chocolate box tray and periodically if you get across one dimple Bethesda lifts you up and pops you down in the next indented little plastic hole. In fact the entire game's spatial design is like the movie Cube, only between every cube you get at least one loading screen. I am convinced that in no small part the decision not to have ground vehicles was precisely to mitigate the frequency with which players would reach the outer boundary of these game tiles. The space travel isn't really travelling in the traditional sense, <laughs> no legal sense even. If this video is ever cited as evidence in a future class action trial over Bethesda's sales and mismarketing antics, because the outer space isn't real either. You fast travel to the spaceship minigame with a fake picture of a planet in the background like a backdrop in an oldie worldy theatre stage. And then you fast travel down to the surface to explore your tile of the world. Once landed, your ship is just an immobile fast travel hub and you can't really fly around in space. Well you can, but nothing happens and the best possible outcome is that you'll find out after several hours that the planet is just a hollow graphic. They also forgot to mention all the loading screens. This is frankly a monumentally impressive act of omission considering that Starfield has more loading screens than any other game in the history of humanity. It was like someone forgetting to mention that there might be insects in the jungle or that the Antarctic might be a little bit chilly. They basically forgot to mention that you don't really explore anything. You fast travel to various location tiles, fast travel nodes and static locations and back again and the only flying is in the Gimbal Space Battle minigame. It's real space travel in the same way that a Star Trek holodeck is real, with the added distinction that if you run in one direction for long enough Unlike a holodeck, in Starfield you actually will face plant into an invisible glass wall and have to turn around. If Todd, I was on the other side of town when we killed her Howard, didn't work in video games, he would probably be a magician, working at children's parties, doing cheap tricks and illusions, and stealing their ice cream. Starfield is to space exploration what Sea Haven is to small town living. Or more precisely, Starfield is the Truman Show of space exploration games. Only a lot funnier on so many levels. Unintentionally of course. The space 
in this space game is neither real nor simulated. It's all an illusion, it's faked. If you head out in any direction for long enough in space you get to nothing and if you do that on land you hit a barrier. On the plus side, at least the heavy duty fast travel system allows you to skip loading screens to get straight where you want to go. Although this technically means that Bethesda uses loading screens to help you cut down on loading screens and cutscenes. Even their loading screens have fucking loading screens, if you will. Obviously every time any of this shit kicked off in the press, Todd, I don't need a condom because I'm sterile Howard, simply does another interview where he spins it as a deliberate design decision or a positive feature. There will always be a job for you at Ubisoft with an attitude like that mate. The off the shelf in game photography system is great, personally I don't indulge but I know a few people who do and they take it very seriously, so I am pleased for them at least. Just a shame you can't take pictures of the loading screens. They don't have internal word filters which is nice. Personally I always like to let rip in video games when I'm naming stuff and we're living in an age where Activision won't even let you name your Call of Duty loadout after rude words. So being able to give my spaceships obnoxious names was frankly a breath of fresh air. I did pay for the damn game so it's my right to mock people with my naming convention. The XP gains are balked as I predicted. Told you so. I shit you not, you will regularly see things like plus 1 XP or plus 4 XP and cry a little on the inside. In fact, it's dreadfully slow going at the start and thanks to diminishing returns it gets progressively more abysmal as you continue. I finished one major quest line recently and the XP bar moved by such a minuscule amount it was almost imperceptible. You can play properly and gradually creep up the levels like a good little obedient peon or you can do what nearly everyone else is doing and make an XP cheesing factory. Find a base with both iron and aluminium deposits, set up a bed, a basic workbench, an iron ore extractor, an aluminium extractor and connect them to some storage containers. Then just spam the following cycle. Sleep, get up, spam adaptive frames until your eyes bleed, rinse and repeat until your brain bleeds. If you get the rejuvenation perk not only will you not have to worry about losing health by running around carrying 67 metric tons of adaptive frames to the vendor but your health will bubble up so quickly when it's maxed out that you will barely have to bother with food or med kits ever again. Being absolutely serious for a moment, I rarely cheese and in Fallout and Skyrim the worst thing I normally do is base building early for XP or grind iron daggers to level up my blacksmithing skill. So here is a genuine warning, Starfield is designed so that if you play the game how it is intended your levelling up will be so painfully slow and laborious that it will factually deteriorate and retard your enjoyment of the game. Unless of course you're going to keep playing forever. And there is a clue right there. A lot of really cool systems and we do so many of them. I think what we really work on is how do all those systems come together and collide and create some really, really cool moments where the players, yourselves, um, have that agency to go really do what you want to do in the game. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. Admiral Logan's office shouldn't be terribly far. Let's go. I can't tell one day from the next anymore. The Media Circus. I think we need to discuss some of the shithouse antics of some of the YouTubers covering this game. 
In the build up to launch I have seen some shameless shilling from some of the content creators who had early access to the game. Clearly some kind of inducements have been offered. Maybe even just a big fat wad of cash. Who knows. But I have seen people pumping out endless buy this product now videos. Videos attacking critics of the game trying to debunk the opinions of people rightly pissed off about things like the frame rate cap, the shitty non-exploration of the 1000 mostly nonsense planets and moons, and the pronouns debacle. And don't get me started about these vacuous candy floss videos where people basically say nothing, but they do so with Starfield in the title because it gets views. I have rarely seen such a flurry of nonsense videos in all my days of complaining about the internet. Frankly, if someone released a video with the title, I was sitting on the toilet and I looked between my legs and one of the turds looked a bit like Starfield. It would not have been the most trivial of the bunch. Shame on the lot of you, but especially the shills who are hiding critical faults in this game. It is buggy. Todd the Sod did lie about a load of stuff as usual and the space exploration sucks balls compared to what we were promised. Stop defending it because you've cut an influencer contract with their promotional company. Allegedly. The shameless shill endorsed hype train has been a monument to how many YouTubers will happily jump on the money train when the shill express pulls into the station. We can only speculate how many of these blind hype and blind shilling videos are paid off, but here is a metric if you want to get a ballpark figure. Remember Redfall did a pre-launch preview of the game where hundreds of YouTubers made obsequious videos reading off a card of key talking points and forgetting to mention that it was one of the worst games of the year? Well go and look through some of these videos if you want to get a handle on how many YouTubers are on the payroll. But do it fast because they will no doubt quietly delete those videos over the coming year, before the worst video games of the year compilation videos come out. You heard it here first. It's also worth noting that despite seemingly shitting cash out of their noses when it comes to paying off the shills to wax lyrical about Starfield, apparently Bethesda didn't issue any early review copies to any UK outlets or YouTubers. We can only assume that this was out of revenge and spite with the UK government meddling with Microsoft acquisition of Activision. And I guess this sums up the level of spite and pettiness of Bethesda and Microsoft. They claim to be all about the players, but they will happily snub an entire nation out of spite and vitriol. Personally, I will not be losing sleep over this one though. Shield's got the shit end of the stick. Oh well. But it's the principle that counts. Starfield can proudly boast having the worst inventory management system in the history of video games. When I figured out how it worked, and I use the term worked very generously here, I came to a point where I realised that it wasn't me being a dullard, it was actually the inventory system that was retardis in extremis. I am not even kidding here. Trying to transfer kit between your inventory and say the ship's hold is so dysfunctional that it required effort to fuck it up this badly. You literally cannot look at what you have and what's in the box at the same time. You have to switch between your pockets, the cargo container and the shop and when I was at my base I had scant idea what was being transferred to what. This is some top tier levels of user interface failure. I'm talking they need to make a special award for this shit and give it to Bethesda. Twice. Maybe give them first, second and third place award for balking up the simplest and most ubiquitous game mechanic since Zork. On numerous occasions I've walked away from the vendor and realised that in my rush I had literally bought back all the materials that I sold. Because I hadn't flipped to my ship inventory, but back to the vendor inventory by mistake buying back the thousands of adaptive frames I just flogged, thus shitting away all of the money I was trying to make. There are some serious temporal issues with the game mechanics. Waiting on a chair or sleeping in order to get a vendor to reset seems to work okay, 
but bases seem to work functionally differently. They barely seem to gather resources when I'm absent, or if I sleep outside of the base, so I tend to come back to fairly empty stocks of metals. So then I have to sleep a couple of times to get the hoppers to fill back up, I use them all up, leave, but when I come back later they've barely restocked. The opposite seems true of the cargo links. They only seem to deliver when I'm away from the base for a period of time, but if I stay there and sleep, then nothing happens. I have no clue what is going on here. Well, what's going on beyond Bethesda's capacity to make video game base mechanics that don't work properly, obviously. The bases only seem to operate properly when I'm there, and the cargo links only seem to operate when I'm not. Obviously, the critical importance of this is that you will have to make sure your cheesing factory has both aluminium and iron on site, because if you are cargo linking in one or the other of the supplies, the whole operation will likely desync and become a bigger shit show than Bethesda's returns policy. The overall system optimization was a real strange fruit. In fact, I struggle to understand what is going on. The fans on my PC don't spin up, the computer certainly seems quite relaxed, and all the problems I get are confined to long loading screens and shit micro stutters and visual lags. It's not melting my PC whilst the game discombobulates. That was nice at least. But yes, it's terribly optimised, yet doesn't seem to stress or overload my PC or my graphics card. I don't know what is going on. My setup should be able to handle it easily, and it's barely getting warm, but the performance is still shite a lot of the time. Now I've heard other people with more technical knowledge say the same thing. Their system resources are not being overtaxed, the PC seems to be ticking along at 50-75% to resource utilisation, yet it's wigging out like they're trying to run the Division 2 on a Pentium 1. It's strange. Like somehow Starfield is running out of resources despite the system having plenty more resources to spare. Todd, honestly she told me she was 19 officer, Howard, was quizzed about it and shared this helpful advice. You may need to upgrade your PC for this game, which roughly translates as, don't be poor. What an arch cock. The vendor credit cap is patently absurd. Make no mistake, people sat around in meetings for weeks discussing this detail, no doubt in one of their thinking zones or collaborative safe spaces, on those wank floor cushions. You know the ones, those big cushions where you can never quite get comfortable. They remind you of infant school and they always end up smelling slightly of arse crack and tramp. My point is that critical and central game metrics like this are poured over and deliberated for months. And when they came to make the decision, some astro tard burbled, five grand. There's loads of ships selling for say 400,000 credits. That's 80 trips to the corner space shop to flog my many bags of vendor crap. Just for that ship. That probably clocks in at about 900 loading screens with loose change. I don't know what they're doing here because in Starfield there is so much crap you can hoover up and stuff you can make at your base that money is effectively free in this game. The only problem is that it is bottlenecked by the vendor caps. I don't know what their point is here, but it certainly appears like they set the cap really low to service some strange agenda. Maybe they want you to explore and look for more vendors via more loading screens, but it is a space exploration game, not a shop exploration game. And besides, you can just sleep for 48-ish hours and the vendor resets. So basically, spam sleep and run back and forth and you're good to go. Breaks up the monotony of the loading screens, I guess. Who knows what the master plan was here? What I do know, however, is that the 5,000 credit cap would have qualified as one of the dumbest things in Starfield if it hadn't been shoved off the pavement by the other torrent of dumb decisions. I did notice that I found one vendor with 11k credits which might have been patched in, but this was so utterly foolish in a game where you can easily come back with 30k's worth of vendor crap from one quick base raid. One time, 
I was staggering around with a quarter of a million credits worth of adaptive frames. So frankly, 11k credits does not really cut it. It's almost as if they figured the loading screens were not annoying enough, so they forced you to experience lots of waiting on bench screens just to sell your crap afterwards. Ultimately, Starfield has problems with its economy in a general sense. There is frankly too much high-value stuff floating around and no adequate way to vendor it without spending lots of time sleeping in a cot until the vendors reset. I am not an economist, but I can count how many trips I have to make to the shops to sell crap. It's basically a resource-rich, currency-poor environment. It's all balanced wrong, and the only workaround involves more sleeping and more loading screens. And here comes another amber boredom warning. Words cannot adequately describe how infuriating it is when you fire up the game for an hour and that entire time is eaten up by simply running between vendors, waiting on benches, waiting on cutscenes and loading screens just so you can offload your cargo in the shops. Bethesda has deliberately choked off the money supply in this game and turned a quick dash to the shops into a ball-crushingly miserable time-consuming fuck-around that you will have to repeat every few hours of play unless you are literally leaving all the loot on the ground. Starfield has all the usual Bethesda creation engine magic that we have come to expect. NPCs talking over each other, companions barking the same lines at you relentlessly, bugs with the captain's locker storage which makes your most valuable and special shit disappear. Your companions and crew will constantly block the habways on your ship and trap you in the cockpit. NPCs standing on chairs, broken quest lines, and a host of functionality and tools buried in obscure sub-options in grey writing so that you have to go on YouTube just to find out how to do something as simple as rename your ship. Then there are the corrupt saves. But more of this later. I could go on, but I have a whole section about how Todd, this never normally happens to me Howard, was possibly telling Porky Pies when he claimed that Starfield was relatively bug free. So let's just say for now, it has bugs. Bugs so bad you may have to reload from an earlier save or even possibly delete your entire playthrough and start from scratch. I guess I have to mention Nexus mods in the context of this game. I used to love that site, and thanks to the stoic hard work of the almost exclusively unpaid modders who post there, stretched out many hundreds of extra hours of Fallout 3 in New Vegas. Modders, I am humbly in your debt. Sadly however, these days, Nexus Mods, the once legendary hosting site, have gone full corpo with a capital Klaus. Well, after the backlash about the idiotic forced inclusion of pronouns in Starfield, someone published a mod which removed them. This was promptly banned by Nexus Mods, and it's turned out that this is not the first time they have dogpiled into the culture wars on the side of Anita Sarkeesian-esque censorship. They banned a Spider-Man 2 mod that removed pride flags and replaced them with American flags. Now I could probably spend a whole day going down this rabbit hole but suffice it to say, Nexus Mods posts all kinds of random shit on its website about supporting diversity and inclusivity and they have clearly taken sides in the culture war. I personally thought the swamping of Call of Duty Modern Warfare with pride flags was a politically motivated disgrace, and if I had a choice, I would have removed them. This does not mean I'm a homophobe, but according to Nexus Mods it does. The best take on this comes from several other commentators, and it goes something like this. The Wi-Fi password people allegedly claim that it's just pronouns, you're not forced to do it, it's no big deal. But then anyone trying to mod it out of the game is having their mods and possibly eventually their Nexus mods accounts banned for trying. So yes, it is clearly a big deal for them. It is compulsory and people are being punished for trying to opt out. 
So the Wi-Fi password people should not falsely claim it's not a big deal. My biggest bugbear with the UI is basically this. It lacks sufficient capacity for interrogation or information gathering. The map is extensive, and as you progress through the game you accumulate a lot of data and survey a lot of planets. But can I do a keyword search for planets with specific resources that I've found? Can I fuck? It's great that you've surveyed 50 planets and found all the resources you need, but when you spontaneously decide to build that titanium mine, you end up having to laboriously click through every known system to find that planet you vaguely remember from three days earlier. Too much information, not enough organisation. It's like giving someone a copy of a first aid manual, but you cut off all the page numbers, ripped out the index, and handed someone all the pages in a jumbled up stack. I'm sure it makes for a fascinating bedtime read, but not much use if your mate is bleeding out on the pavement. There is simply information that you need to be able to access more easily and remotely. I want to be able to look up the resources I need for a mineral extractor when I'm actually at the corner shop in a killer buying minerals. I don't want to have to look it up on the internet. I need to be able to pull up a list of my outposts and what they're producing and where they're sending it while I'm standing in the street. I need to be able to search my surveyed planets list for specific minerals. But you can't. And if you can, it's somehow buried in the background somewhere. My brain is too withered to commit all this information to memory. So as usual, I end up constantly windowing out to YouTube to search for a quick guide. Maybe this is deliberate. Maybe they want lots of traffic going to YouTube. Who knows? I mean, fuck. I literally lost one of my bases and I can't be fucked to look for it. Imagine if you went up to the British Navy and asked them how many ports they have and a chief petty officer just grinned at you stupidly and said, Lots. We don't keep a list though. Just look up and down the coast and you'll find them eventually. That's what we do. I hope people can see the irony here. This game is set 300 years in our utopian sci-fi future and it's got an in-game UI that would seem like hot shit 15 years in our past. It's clunky, lacks important information, and you can't search or sort according to critical metrics like resources or bases. I mean, that is what computers are for, right? Sorting information and stuff. Think about that, you can't even pull up a list of your own bases. You have to memorise them or hunt for them on the galaxy map. And on the subject of maps, locally you don't get any. Seriously, this game doesn't have a proper map, just a star chart. Apparently this is going to be patched in later too. So basically it's Skyrim in space, without a map of Skyrim. Were they high? Frankly this game seriously needs an in-game notepad function like the long dark. After I'd used it a couple of times in that game, I realised how an in-game notepad function can compensate for a lot of a game's information handling issues, and it's a very valuable tool. One major problem with the game is its arbitrary 10 ship limit. I legitimately assumed there wouldn't be any limit. Imagine my shock when I tried to board a sweet Class B ship and found I couldn't because I had capped out on ships. The ships are entirely modular, you paint them by colours from the predefined options and they ain't that complicated. It's a small amount of data for fuck's sake. 10 is too small a cap. As far as I am aware, there are 7 free ships that you get during the course of the game. So basically, if you want to leave one slot free for piracy, you have two slots spare. But worry ye not, brethren. Once Todd I only had one drink officer Howard opens his little ye oldy weldy in-game microtransaction shoppy in Starfield and they start selling ships in-game, you can bet your aching gamer ass that this number will increase in tandem in order to accommodate all of your new ships in the shop. The amount of cope online is ridiculous. 
The same people who took the King Shilling to promote this game are now jumping to the defence of Todd, they faked the moon landings Howard, and trying to rewrite history like only a fool would assume there would be real space travel. Frankly, it doesn't surprise me that there are huge disparities between mainstream reviews and user reviews, between YouTuber reviews and Steam reviews. It's because it's hard to have a sensible conversation about this game, because there are so many outlets and YouTubers spewing forth torrents of cope and promotional key talking points at every legitimate complaint, like they're running a 1950s Soviet propaganda department trying to promote gulags as holiday homes. And yes, YouTube user S6E45GV46, I did notice the female eyes in the game, mate. I see everything. I watch you while you sleep. Some of the NPCs look like they replaced their Optrex with Botox. Oh, and thank you for your kind patience, FY fucking I. Then, of course, there is the gender non binary character creation. Of course, it's gender neutral, and you actually have to select your fucking pronouns. That's embarrassing. <laughs> now, people will have different opinions on the significance of this and how much it affects the game, and in the interests of impartiality and fairness, I will try at least and handle this issue sensitively because I do appreciate that for many people, behaving like a woke fucking cretin makes them feel like they're actually achieving something in their miserable small-minded lives. So I will merely state this. When a video game desexes the player characters and has a gender pronoun test, of course it matters. Once again, the reasonable majority are being co-opted to play silly buggers to pamper to a section of society that accounts for less than a tiny fraction of a fraction of 1%. You see, this is how you politically indoctrinate a society, through omission and normalisation. An entire generation of young gamers are now routinely being exposed to content that 1. disintegrates the concept of gender and sex, and 2. normalises the concept of people selecting their pronouns. Think about this. You cannot select your gender in Starfield and you cannot even play the game unless you proceed via the pronoun selection screen. Now apparently it's voluntary, but when I came across it I couldn't back out, so in order to play the damn game I was forced to enter something. I'm sure Jordan Peterson would have something to say about that. Now I'm not holding Bethesda solely responsible for this, Nearly all video games are pulling this shit as part of their ESG compliancy, to some degree. I'm merely pointing out that they are just another brick in the wall. But make no mistake, this is significant, because all this shit just chips away at kids' construction of the world and shapes their understanding of their place within it. It normalises this stupidity. It encourages gender fluidity and serves to eradicate any mention of gender and sex. It's political, very political, and people should not be unilaterally obliged to comply. I'm sorry, but 99.9% .9 of the human race is male or female, and nobody has any issues talking about male and female in sheep farming, horse breeding, or genetics. I appreciate there's a very small percentage of people who have a personal experience different from this, and they have my absolute full support. I'm just querying why suddenly we're supposed to believe that in the last 20 years, the entire human race has suddenly become some kind of androgynous, non-binary mass of hairless earth beings smeared across a spectrum of gender, separate from every other mammalian species on the planet. Sorry, but we ain't that special. The massive rise in non-binary gender attribution is clearly a subcultural event. I am not trying to belittle the experience or be insensitive to people who have genuine issues. I'm merely saying that the majority of people who opt into this shit are doing it for subcultural, fashionable and political reasons. And if you don't believe me, go and get a TikTok account.
This is all a social construct, a political fad, a subculture which is being weaponised by corporations and billionaires in order to sell your kids puberty blockers and plastic surgery. So yes, I completely understand why some people will simply refuse to let their kids near a video game that quite literally denies your identification as male or female, and then forces you to assign yourself pronouns. What are they going to do in the next video game? Have a tutorial at the start where you get sent to an equity and diversity training seminar and at every street corner there are soldiers saying papers please. This shit matters and they really need to be pulled up on this every damn time. If this shit didn't matter, ESG compliant corporations like Bethesda wouldn't be doing it and ESG compliant corporations like Nexus Mods wouldn't be banning people for trying to un- do it. Now if you don't think this is an issue, let me flip it on its head. Imagine if we started laying down the rules to woke video game developers that make touchy-feely comfort space games, and we dictated that all their games have to have guns, blood and gore. And when they complain, we just say, well, it's optional, you don't have to use the guns. All this being said, frankly, it's all just posturing and virtue signalling. They include pronouns so as to guarantee to cause a bit of outrage and to signal their ESG compliance status, but they do it in such a half assed attempt. What about all the other pronouns? There are thousands of them apparently, but we only get to choose from a set of three. I heard from someone that apparently Facebook has 76 genders or some such shit. What about cat pronouns? What about those people who think they're dogs? Surely pedos have their own pronouns by now? What about special pronouns for those weirdos on TikTok that can't decide what their pronouns are? My pronouns are fuckface, fucker and fucktard. No sign of them in Starfield. Combat. The combat is what you would expect really, it's a slightly less janky version of Fallout 4. Possibly a slightly more janky version of Fallout 4, depending on who you speak to. But you do at least get to float around in zero G sometimes during spaceship boarding assaults. Many enemies are bullet sponges. All of my battles tended to be a complete nightmare and then late game a complete pushover. The enemy AI is shitty, another issue that Todd, you can't have caught it from me Howard, tried to sell as a positive, FYI. The combat balancing seems a bit balked, the guns are fairly generic and uninspired, and early game I tended to just spam a lot of medkits whilst getting drilled from long range. There was one issue that I honestly thought was a bug until I saw it clarified in Synthetic Man's review of the game. Some enemy health bars just fill up again. They have multiple health pools apparently. No explanation of that in the game. I honestly thought it was just the game wigging out on me, and I was planning on adding it to the list of bugs. Maybe I still should, but apparently it's a feature. The bullet spongy enemies sometimes have multiple health pools, and you have to work your way progressively through the whole menagerie of sponges. Well done. Overall though, I guess the combat is fine, and what I expected, a go, it's a bit weak. There were a few nods to antiquated guns and a few interesting weapons I liked. They have an EM weapon that stuns enemies which seems to be a concession for a pacifist playthrough style, which is frankly a nice idea, if you're a pacifist, which I'm not. I found myself using an old school pump action shotgun for the sake of nostalgia, but I had to give it up because I couldn't find a rare or epic version, and it rapidly got outpaced by my strange alien religious fanatics Varoon shotgun thing, which not only did more damage, but debuffed the enemy with some kind of 
space aids. The combat is adequate, but certainly not good enough to be a selling point. Maybe later I'll find some more interesting guns, and I am certainly aware that some players have combined certain weapons, perks and abilities to create some really interesting combat styles. But generally, combat for me has involved this slightly less sophisticated algorithmic approach. 1. I look in my bag for the gun with the biggest damage number next to it. 2. I check that I have plenty of bullets for it. 3. There is no 3. My main takeaways were these. Optically, I thought it was sometimes hard to pick out targets and the general visual noise and grunge and clutter in the background. Everything seems to be a bit greenish, bluish grey, and the enemies are not usually an exception. The game basically seems to have this space ish colour palette and apply it to general art design, interior design, and the enemy NPCs alike. You know how on one occasion a Battlefield game kind of fucked up its colour palette at launch so enemies weren't visually distinct from the other clutter in the environment? Well, that is happening here a lot. And sadly the only way around it is to pick perks that highlight enemies when you stick a recon scope in their general direction. Or just use your scanner to pick them out, because they glow bright blue. Or turquoise. Possibly cyan. Fuck, I don't know. I'm not an interior designer. Also, at certain times, against certain levels of mobs, the enemies can shoot in a ridiculously effective manner. There have been plenty of occasions where the AI has magic, possibly psychic, shooting abilities. At this time I was in a factory, and I could barely see these guys, but they were shooting right at me constantly, and even shooting through tiny gaps between pipes, support frames, even doing this single shot in a super prescient manner. They were behaving like AI, not NPCs, if you catch my distinction. I don't know what the FPS version of map hacking is, but they were doing that. Whilst I was spotted, they knew precisely where I was, they robotically calculated the geometry of any possible firing solution, even if it was a tiny crack between two pipes. This felt a bit unnatural. A huge problem with the combat is your photo bombing companions. The parthing of the companions in combat is absolute and total arse crumble. If you're working an edge for cover, your helpful companion will wedge themselves in there between you and the corner. If you're sniping, it is inevitable that you will hear screams of ouchie as they face block your shot with their craniums. The only thing they can do reliably and consistently well is YOLO straight at the enemy and get battered, and when they're not doing that, they are constantly placing themselves precisely between you and whatever you are trying to shoot. You know those not so funny animal videos where crows, monkeys and squirrels are blocking people's security cameras and staring into them? Well it's like that, only it's not a camera, it's a rifle scope, and it's not so funny here either because usually you end up shooting them in their fucking wincing face. I personally never served, but I do know this about warfare. Photo bombing and sniper scopes don't mix. Although as soon as I said that I realised it would make for some really hilarious videos. On a positive note, the stealth archer meta is back. Happy days. In fact, I would consider some concession to stealth mandatory in Starfield, especially the chameleon ability. Being able to stealth when crouching and not moving is godly. In fact, some leaning into stealth is probably mandatory to mitigate the insane accuracy of the NPCs and turrets, and to capitalise on the fact that the NPC AI has brain damage when it comes to attention span, combined with the memory problems of that dude in Memento. I shit ye not. Just run back around the corner, crouch and let stealth wipe you from the memory of all the NPCs in about 20 seconds. Then go in for another stealth attack, possibly even have a quick sleep on the nearby bed to bubble up health. Not kidding. A few minutes staring at the perk tree will make you quickly realise that investing heavily into being a silent sniper ninja 
means you can literally one-shot enemies and the NPC next to them will barely lift his eyes away from his porno. I do question the sleep mechanics however. In Starfield, a lot of the time, I could literally grab a power nap in the middle of a battle. Christ, I managed to have a quick nap nap during a ship boarding assault and I woke up with an enemy dude a few feet from me. It's hilarious. No doubt to be patched out soon. I do think the omission of VATS is a woeful decision. I really rate VATS in Fallout because it means gamers that struggle with FPS due to skill, mobility, injury, a really low NPC, or they're just shit like me, can still experience the full glory of the combat on the hardest difficulties by segueing away from the hand-eye coordination aspects of the combat. I generally tend to use both VATS and ADS in Fallout and I always felt VATS combat was an entirely optional, incredibly equitable mode of combat. Publishers and developers bleat on all day about accessibility in video games, but personally I thought VATS was literally the biggest and best shining example of real accessibility in single person games with first person combat, but instead they removed VATS and added pronouns. Good work, dumbasses. There's a strange lack of damage feedback in combat. I'm not a fan of the over the top on screen blood dripping, but Starfield is literally a game where you can be close to death without barely noticing. This happens in ship combat too. The lack of atmospheric damage messaging is an omission that needs to be fixed. Maybe a little red hue on your screen when you're bleeding out in a shootout. Maybe a few sparks flying around the cockpit, Star Trek style when your ship is halfway to exploding. But it's a common gripe in Starfield, you kind of have to check your health bars constantly because there is a lack of intuitive feedback from the game itself, or at least consistent feedback. It's hard to define, but let's just say this, when you are close to death in Call of Duty, you just know. We also can't ignore the insane lack of balancing with the perks and game mechanics. Because of the combination of cumulative stacking and additive effects of the combat perks on top of the weapon stats and perks, and their combined interaction, you can very easily break the game. Big shout out to Uncle Mumble for his most excellent video, Starfield's Most Broken Skill. The TLDR is that stacking certain perks makes you godly at all levels. You can turn your mining cutter into the power of the sun for killing aliens, or turn a tiny laser pistol into a xenomorph incinerator. Do you remember the small caliber explosive pipe gun in Fallout 4, and how the combination of perks, rate of fire and explosive damage would make it melt death claws? Well. Let's just say there's a lot of that shit in Starfield. Start grinding those adaptive frames, brothers and sisters, because you are going to want to start grinding out those assignments to level up certain combat perks very quickly. It's significantly worth noting that as Uncle Mumble rightly points out, the entire interface is balked and unreliable and both the weapon upgrade bench, your inventory and the combat damage on your screen during battle might habitually give you conflicting or incorrect information. So as with so many aspects of this game, you are often better off trusting your gut about what works or watching a guide, because the alleged facts in this game, well that cake is a lie. ship combat. The ship combat doesn't really require a profound amount of analysis. It's basically like any other space fighting game, only it feels like you're fighting in a virtual fishbowl with you at the centre. Because you are effectively fighting in a virtual fishbowl. It's like Everspace without the real actual 3D world out there to fly around in. 
it is sadly a mini game and nothing more. It's certainly not joyless. Sometimes it's actually satisfying and it definitely adds to the overall experience, but there really isn't much going on here. The biggest driving factors are how strong is your ship and shields, how many of the ship boosting perks you have levelled up, how much DPS you're putting out, and frequently it's about how fast you can knock out the first enemy and hit boost to break the missile lock on the rest. It's Lanchester's Law, boost to break missile lock, more Lanchester's Law, and this is all multiplied by the relative DPS and shield strengths of the ships involved. Seriously, it's all about having a decent ship and taking out one enemy immediately with a huge alpha strike. Targeting weapon systems can help, but basically you kind of only do that when you've got it in the bag already. It's Lanchester's Law multiplied by having the tankier, high DPS ship. On top of this, the AI basically just targets the middle of your ship, centre of mass if you will. The mischievous denizens of the interwebs have already figured out that if you make a ship based around a frame structure where it's hollow in the middle, the centre of mass is a big void of nothing. So the sophisticated, highly nuanced and thoroughly beta tested enemy AI will relentlessly shoot its weapon straight through the middle of your ship where the hole is, and the missiles will spend so long spinning around in circles that the fight is usually long over before more than a few of them accidentally hit any part of your ship. I set out to test this theory courtesy of a couple of internet guides, and I can confirm that even a skillless fuck like me can quickly figure out how to build a lopsided shitshow of a hollow ship and immediately become the terror of the high seas. Slash space minigame. Once you figure out how to break the system, you realise how, at its core, it really is very broken. You can set up gravity defying landing gear all down one side of your ship and stick all your engines out on some boom. AE feet above and to the right of you, and despite the laws of physics saying otherwise, your ship doesn't topple over when it lands, nor spin around in circles when it flies. It's wonderful. I have never seen a construction minigame which is so full of bloody rules, and yet none of them seem to relate to real, actual physics. The ships are very, very pretty. Everything out of the windows looks very dramatic, it all feels very atmospheric, but there really is not much going on here by ways of deep simulation, or deep combat mechanics. It's World of Tanks without the maps. Starfield Space Combat has a lot more in common with manning a ball turret than actual dogfighting, but it is perversely fun at times albeit mostly when you're making some ridiculously impossible ship, and then naming it something that will make easily triggered people cry. I'm compelled to note that the architecture of the ship construction is a masterclass in fusing interior and exterior modelling. I don't know the science, and maybe this is merely a pleasant artefact of how the game modelling is constructed, but it is so magnificent that it is worthy of mention. The windows certainly seem real, or they at least real enough to fool me. What I mean by this is that what you see out of the window seems to represent what is actually outside the ship in that direction. This doesn't seem like much when you're sitting in the cockpit, but when you start to put portholes in random parts of the ship, it's actually rather pleasant that they certainly appear to work, and you can see out of your ship and view what is going on outside. It's a nice touch. Next time I accidentally jump out of my seat, I will quickly take a walk around and try and watch the battle from the next porthole. But it certainly seems like the windows are all real views on the exterior environment. I'm prepared to be corrected, but if it's true, then this is a feat worth mentioning. The ship piracy is good fun, but maybe that's because I've watched the whole of the Expanse series multiple times and I strongly advise you all to do the same. 
It's just nice to occasionally cripple the last ship and board it, then YOLO on board like Clay Sashford, killing the innocent and stealing their ship because it's funny. It's just a great shame that it's such a shit way to make money in Starfield. Basically, in order to sell your pirated ship, you need to register it first. It's like a carbon tax, if you will, and it's usually about 90% of the raw value of the ship itself. So given the extensive fuck around involved, it's just not really worth your time pirating ships to raise cash. The sale price is a fraction of the purchase value, and you lose 90% of that in registration charges. So you might end up snaffling a really nice ship and only end up making 5 to 10k. That's one or two trips to a vendor with many millions of adaptive frames you've made, and we don't want to disrupt that part of the grippingly exciting game loop. Not to mention the fact that this process will shift all the worthless vendor trash from the pirated ship into your cargo hold, so you end up spending 10 to 15 minutes at a vendor carefully selling off notepads, folders, and packets of food made out of insects. I guess at least it's a nice break from the loading screens. The shipbuilding and customization. Broken ship designs aside, the shipbuilding and customization is, well, an incomprehensible mess of systems and vastly more modular and less creative than I would have liked. This said, I will admit that I got a feeling of pride and accomplishment after I first managed to upgrade my basic bitch learner ship into something more sinister. With massively upgraded cargo capacity, lasers stacked on top of lasers, and a tiny slither of extra shield, it suddenly became slightly more competitive. Not gonna lie though, when I finally got my company car from the Free Star Collective, it was insanely satisfying climbing into the captain's seat on the luxurious and spacious deck. Despite being needlessly obtuse and inadequately explained, there is some fun and functionality to be had with the shipbuilding. Sure, it's highly modular, it has issues with diminishing returns, and for a long while most of your attempts to build a custom hot rod will turn out to be a disaster because of failing to attend to certain mechanics and rules about which you can't figure out, getting endless warnings that don't make sense, and then having the building mode bug out and declare a part of the ship is not attached when it factually is, and it can all end up with you scrapping the whole thing and starting again. But Watching the extraordinary levels of creativity demonstrated by some of the online shipbuilding fanatics, it's clearly an area of the game some people are obsessing about. I guess in some ways it's a victory of style and flavour over substance, but a victory nevertheless. People are enjoying this aspect of the game, so more power to them. The Base Building the base building can be best described as amusingly catastrophic. It is literally so broken and balked that even Bethesda must feel proud. I have seen SOME people pull off some majestic showcase builds, but personally I found it too fickle and bugged to invest in heavily, in its current pre-patch state at least. I just went back to my cheese factory to grind some more adaptive frames, only to find out that all the storage containers in my base had de-wired themselves so 99% of my storage capacity was now seemingly locked. For those of you who have not played the game, that means I need to delete half of my massive base and start again, or individually unwire and rewire 100 plus containers again. <laughs> Which I'm not going to do. On one hand you have the production and supply systems that in some ways are reminiscent of aspects of X series. Fallout 4, factories, and possibly some other factory sims, but it's not truly freeform base building as you might expect. Essentially, you stick down your land claim on a planet or moon and set out your footprint for your base. 
You have a variety of modular items to place down, such as solar panels, little devices that mine any minerals present, prefabricated hab units, landing pads, storage units, and it all comes along with a whole slate of furniture and workbenches to customise the utility and aesthetics of your personal little Moonbase Alpha. It is a bit like the base building in Fallout 4, only with a much heavier emphasis on the factory side of things. Much less creative scope, because you are primarily picking cookie cutter prefab units to place them down on the ground, and there is not much point to any of it. You have plenty of scope to personalise the interiors, and make your little housey look pretty. But the base building is a bit more like making a factory out of shipping containers, than handcrafting a log cabin and landscaping a garden. On one hand you have a glorious OCD minigame, but, and this is a big but, it is barely explained, can get very convoluted and you have to plumb all the different units together. And I use the term plumb very deliberately here. I suspect this will all get a massive overhaul in some later patch, because right now, it's a bit of a fuck farm of dev tools mashed into a user interface for the players to use. I frankly would never have worked it out without help from YouTube tutorials. It's frankly about as intuitive as trying to design a custom PCB board without any training or instruction. I would also note that the lists of known bugs, errors and problems with the outposts is already legion. And that is without factoring in issues such as corrupt saves, miswiring your storage, all the stuff that just don't work properly. But for now, the important part is this. You can make bases. You set up power sources. You mine minerals. You set up factories that make random widgets. You can decorate your own little bedroom. It's the my first dolly of space construction. My honest advice to anyone is simply this. Find a place with iron and aluminium set up some workbenches for crafting and research, throw down some consoles for picking up quests and paying off bounties, build a couple of bunk beds for taking nap naps, and leave it at that until it's all patched up. All the glass is incidentally bulletproof. Of course it is, because clearly if you could shoot through the windows, then they would have to deal with decompression mechanics. They missed another sci-fi trick there. That said, I think this was probably the archaic game engine and not just pure laziness, because I can't remember there ever being destructible windows in any game using this game engine. Quite sad really, because imagine just how cool it would be if someone shot out your base window and everyone got sucked out the hole. Never going to happen though, because certainly in my base the game engine struggles to stop my base engineer from hanging out in the open airlock wearing just his jimmy jammies. So good luck with anything more complicated than generally stopping the NPCs from wandering around in a vacuum in their skiddies. The base system in its current form fundamentally fails on a few grounds. Resources are not shared across bases by a link. You have to literally organise a cargo link, wire it to a container and hope the right ship flows into the hopper and then it gets transported out ad infinitum. It's warehouse supply chain management really. I could not figure out a way to select specific items from my storage containers without physically going around the base hunting through each and every fucking one of them for the exact thing I was looking for. Sure, the workbenches auto-grab on-site resources when you're making stuff at a workbench, but when you decide to manually transport individual stuff to another planet to set up a new base, I could never find that shit. So you end up buying it from a shop, which kinda makes storing most of it a pointless exercise in hoarding. They need some kind of terminal where you can access any resources on the outpost and stick it in your bag. Maybe there is a way to do it. I tried to do it, but if I did the right thing, then that's broke too. Base building needs a thorough rework if it's going to have any kind of point at all and have any kind of longevity in the game, beyond being a way to make a little housey 
where you can show off your new pew pew guns or nice little racks to your virtual annoying girlfriend whilst you're spamming adaptive frames. And I guess this is a good time to repeat something I said earlier. Quantity has a quality all of its own. Gunplay and combat, ship combat, ship building and customization, base building. None of these things are outstanding in Starfield. They're not bad. There is some fun to be had, but they ain't great. The combat is okay, the ship combat is kind of fun at times, the ship building passes the time, but the point is that you cycle through these and many other different mini games as you play, and you generally don't dwell on any particular aspect for long enough to really notice that any particular individual activity gets quite boring quite quickly, if done for any length of time. But within the wider context of all the other busy work, it's easy not to worry about it. Well, I guess I should give you pause to contemplate and recharge your batteries before I continue my diatribe about what should have been my Game of the Decade contender. If Todd, of course everyone in the office trusts me, Howard, had been telling the truth. But that, as they say, is the problem. But for now, good luck and happy hunting.